In this segment, we will take a look at some review problems from algebra, specifically the types of questions that you might encounter in calculus. So this is the review of algebra for calculus purposes. And let's begin with something very simple, such as finding the equation of a line that goes through two points. And I know you've done this question a million times in your previous algebra classes, but just refreshing everybody's memory on that. For example, slope is change in y over change in x or we can write it as y sub 2 minus y sub 1 over x sub 2 minus x sub 1 if you assume the points um, are x sub 1, y sub 1, comma, x sub 2, y sub 2. And the equation of a line in point slope form is y minus y sub 1 equals m times x minus x sub 1. Of course, there are different forms of the equation of a line, and you may use any one of those as long as you get the correct answer. That would be fine with me. So to get the equation of a line, we need to start by finding the slope. So let's do that. And I'll assume these are my points x1, y1, and these are x2, y2. So change in y going in the correct order. So 2 minus negative 3 divided by negative 5 minus 2. So we have 2 plus 3, or 5, divided by negative 7. In other words, the slope we're getting is negative 5 sevenths. And let's use either one of these two points. I'll pick the first one. It really doesn't matter which one you select. You should come up with the correct final answer at this point. So y minus the y-coordinate of that point equals the slope times x minus the x-coordinate. So now all we have to do is simplify. And over here, right now, we have y plus 3. And to solve for y, you would need to subtract 3 from both sides. So our final answer is y equals negative 5 over 7x plus 10 over 7 minus 3, which I can write as 21 over 7 to get common denominators. And the answer can be left as negative 5 sevenths x minus 11 sevenths. So that is the equation of the line going through the given points and um, basically with the given slope because we determined the slope. Two points uniquely determines a line. So now we have the equation of that line. Uh, please take a look at the question number two and try it with this uh, reminder from question number one. And the only other thing you're going to need to know is perpendicular lines have slopes that are negative reciprocals of each other. So at this point, you may want to try question number two. Take a moment, pause the video if you would, and come back to check your answer. So hopefully you gave this problem a try, and let's check out the solution down at the bottom of the page here. So the line that was given to us was y equals 8x minus 1. And we know from the form y equals mx plus b that the coefficient of x is m, or represents the slope of the line. So for this question, 8 is the slope. So the given slope is 8. What about the slope of the perpendicular line? That is the negative reciprocal of 8, so negative 1 8. And now we need the equation of the line. Again, use the given point as your x sub 1, y sub 1, and go back to that point slope form of the equation of a line to complete the question. So y minus 1 equals negative 1 8 times x minus 0. We distribute to negative 1 8 and add 1 to get the answer. OK, here is another question. Can you find the equation of the line through the given point and that is parallel to the given line? And if it's given in this format, how can we determine the slope of this given line? So what we need to do is solve for y. So we, we want this in the form y equals mx plus b format. So let's solve for y in there so we can determine what the slope is, right? So here we have 4y equals negative 2x plus 3. So y equals negative 2 fourths x plus 3 fourths. In other words, negative a half x plus 3 fourths. So what is the slope here? 
negative a half, right? That's the given line. And since we're looking for a line that is parallel to this, so the slope of the line that is parallel to the given line will be equal to the same thing, right? Because parallel lines have the same slope. So we are going to work with a slope of negative one half, and the given point that we have is x sub one, y sub one is one comma three. Now, can you write the equation of the line? Again, this will be a good point to pause the video and complete the question on your own. So here I've set it up, y minus three equals the slope times x minus one. And all we need to do is distribute and simplify. So y minus three equals negative a half x plus a half, right? We're distributing the negative one half to both of these and then add the three and we're done. Negative a half x plus a half plus three. And to get the common denominators, we could multiply the top and the bottom by two. And that will leave us with a final answer of y equals negative one half x plus seven halves. Again, pretty standard questions from your typical uh, maybe Algebra 1 classes. So if you're doing okay so far, would you take a look at the next question? And again, give it a shot and then come back and check your work. And here's a hint. So you want the line to be perpendicular to the line through these two points. So you want to find the slope of the given uh, of the line that joins these two points, right? Get the perpendicular slope and then use this point in determining your equation. And let me show you guys the solution for that one. So there is our given slope. There is the perpendicular slope and there is a setup for the equation of the line. Okay, then I'd like to go over with you a little bit about solving equations, linear and quadratic. The first example here is a linear equation. Again, just like any other question, and I'm not going to say it anymore, but you would be highly recommended throughout these video uh, series um, to stop the video often and to work the problems on your own. Anytime you know how to finish the problem, just pause the video. That is really going to be the best way to benefit from these videos. So for this question, it's a linear function, or a linear equation rather. Um, and what I'd like to do is I'd like to get rid of the denominators by multiplying both sides by the least common denominator or 15. Of course, there are various ways to solve this equation and any one of those ways would be okay with me as long as you show your work and as long as you get the same answer, you're fine. So I'll multiply both sides by 15, that side by 15 and this side by 15, and then distribute the 15. So 15 times the first term gives us, um, let's see, 5 goes into 15 three times, 3 times 3y three is 9y plus 15 equals, when you distribute the other 15 on the right hand side, 3 goes into 15 five times, and 5 times 4y is 20y. I'm going to collect the y's on the right hand side, so I will subtract 9y from both sides. 20y minus 9y is 11y, and I'll collect the constants on the left hand side, so I will add 30 to both sides. 15 plus 30 is 45. And to finish the question, just solve for y dividing both sides by 11, right? 45 divided by 11. And something we see with linear equations is that typically have no solution or one solution, but you will never have two solutions for a linear equation. Now, in the next problem, we have a quadratic equation. And for quadratic equations, you may have zero, one, or two solutions. And the approach that you've learned in your algebra classes is first get everything on one side um, and get zero on the other side for quadratics, right? And then try to factor it. If it doesn't factor, use the quadratic formula. So I'm going to try to factor it first. 2x squared is 2x times x. 
and the last terms when multiplied should be negative 2. Let me start it this way. Negative 2 times positive 1. And check the middle term. So plus 1x minus 4x will, do, will give you indeed negative 3x. Right, so again, I'm not going into too much details about factoring here, but just refreshing your memory about that. We can take a trinomial and factor it into two binomials, and I know there are different techniques to do that, but ultimately, whatever you do, if you FOIL it, you should be able to get the initial quantity. So I looked for two, two things that multiply to 2x squared. I wrote them as 2x and x. Then I looked for two basically factors of negative 2, and this may take you a little bit trial and error how to put them correctly, like you may switch them, make this a negative, make that a positive, if it's not working on the first try. Um, but again, hopefully you've had enough practice of this that, um, that it doesn't take you that long to factor. But if you're having trouble there, please go to Google, search factoring quadratics, and you know go through a specific tutorial just for that. In this situation, the product of two factors is equal to zero. That means either one or the other must be zero. So if 2x plus 1 is zero, we get x is negative 1 half. If x minus 2 is zero, we get x is equal to 2. So two solutions in this case. Okay, what about the next example, x squared plus x minus 1 equals to 0. Same question for every equation you see on this page. Solve the given equation for x. So I'll give you a moment to work on this, and then please come back, check your results. Okay, if you try to factor this one, Pretty quickly, you're going to run out of options. x squared is x times x. Negative 1 is plus 1 times negative 1. And there is nothing else to try, really. And if you write it that way, what is the middle term? Plus 1x minus 1x. It's 0x. It doesn't match what was given to us. Therefore, we really cannot factor this quantity. What we must use instead is the quadratic formula, where x equals... So, given an equation of the form ax squared plus bx plus c equals to 0, then quadratic formula tells us that the solutions will be negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. So, we need to know that um, for some of the problems in this class, so make sure you're familiar and well-versed with your quadratic formula, and let's apply to this question. So x equals our a is 1, b is 1, and c is negative 1, right? a is the coefficient of x squared, b is the coefficient of x, and c is negative, the constant term, in this case, negative 1. So the formula says negative of b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac everything divided by 2a, and if we simplify that, we will get negative 1 plus or minus the square root of 1 plus 4, which will be 5, all over 2. And if you convert this to a decimal, basically the plus 1 and the minus 1 is going to give you two different answers. Um, so one is, has a negative in the middle, and the other one has a positive in the middle. And if you were to graph this function, uh, what you're going to see is if you convert these into decimals, that these two points are the x-intercepts of the graph of x squared plus x minus 1. And with a quadratic function, you can have two intercepts in a situation like that, for instance, or you can have one intercept in a situation like that, or you can have no intercepts, for example, a situation like this or like that. So a second-degree equation, which is a graph of a parabola, right? And it can have 0, 1, or 2 solutions. Now let's check the next one. And first I would put that in standard form. Then I would try to factor it. 
okay, plus five. It can only be uh, the factors of plus five are plus five and plus one, or negative five and negative one. And you can put them in different positions. Um, like in this case, I'm getting 7x. If I put the 5 on the other side, it's going to be even larger. If I try the two negatives, um, you're going to have like, for example, if I try to make this a negative, make this a negative, you will have negative 5x minus 2x. That's not going to work. Switch to negative 5 on the other side. Basically, whatever you try, you're going to see that this cannot be factored. And when you come to that conclusion, once again, you can use the quadratic formula. And for this question, I've already done that, so I'm going to sh just show you the answer. So my a is 2, b is negative 3, and c is 5. So I have negative of b plus or minus square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. And if we simplify what's under the radical, Something interesting happens. We have basically a negative number under the radical, right? Because 4 times 5 is 20. 20 times 2 is 40. That's negative 40 plus 9. That's negative 31. So what this is saying is there is no real solution. If you were to graph this parabola, that you see the part on the left-hand side of your equation, where you have a zero on the right-hand side, if you graph that equation, that it will not um, cross the x-axis. And you can still simplify this in terms of the imaginary numbers i. The square root of negative 1 is represented by i. And even though we're not going to do that much with complex numbers in this class, those of you taking differential equations will need to know that. So this will be a good time to review that concept as well if you're going to be going all the way up to differential equations. And we had one last example on that page. So I hope you got a chance to try that one as well. The main thing to remember here is you cannot do x plus 3 is 5 or x minus 3 is 5. That logic only applies if you have a zero on the right-hand side. Then you can set the factors equal to zero. For this one, we must distribute. Distribute the left-hand side. And that's one of the famous identities, right? A plus B times A minus B. This is a good identity to know. Equal, that's difference of two squares, right? A squared minus B squared. If you didn't remember that, of course, you could FOIL it, but you will get x squared minus 9 equals to 5. Since the x term is missing, you could solve this simply by putting the constants on the right-hand side. So x squared is 14. Therefore, x is plus or minus the square root of 14. All right, here is another good example, a review of algebra using functions and graphs. Um, I'd like for us to concentrate on question 1, A through E. So if you could look at the question, answer the best that you can, and then come back and check the solution, please. So F is the blue line, red, um, G is the red curve. Identify domain and range for f and g. So domain is a set of all possible x values. Let's just look at f, for example. f extends on the x from negative 4 to positive 4, so that's your domain for f. And what about the range? Uh, the range for f is anywhere, that's the possible y values, right? And that goes anywhere from negative 3 I'm talking about the range, so let's come down here. Range of f is negative 3. That's because the lowest point of f on the y is negative 3. And the highest point of f along the y-axis is 5. So the range of f is negative 3 to 5. Similarly, you can go through the domain and range for g. I'll let you guys check the answers there. For part b, identify f of negative 2 and g of 3. So this is just a simple reading of the graph. f of negative 2. So find negative 2 on, on the x-axis, which is right here, and then go down to the function f to determine its value. 
So just come on down to f and see what we're reading off right there. So f of negative 2 is going to be negative 1. And what about g of 3? So now find a point 3. The tick marks here and here. This is that point 3. And now go to the g. And if you follow the lines there, g of 3 will take you all the way down to negative 4. So that is the answer for that one. g of 3 is negative 4. The next question was asking, solve the equation f of x equals g of x. For that one, we look back to the graph. Wherever they intersect, read off the x-coordinate there. That will be the answer. And that is negative 1 from the graph. I'm running out of colors here, but let me try yellow. Right here is where they intersect. And the x-coordinate there is negative 1. So the answer to C is x equals negative 1. Uh, what was the next question? Solve the equation f of x is equal to 2. So for that one, I will draw a line right through the point 2. And wherever that line intersects f of x, that's the solution. And the solution is always given in terms of the x value. So in this case, the answer is going to be 1. So f of x equals to 2, the solution is x equals 1. And the last one, if g of x is 0, what is x? So g of x was our red curve. So wherever that hits the x-axis, those are going to be the solutions there. So g of x equals 0 at this point, at this point, and at this point. So the answers are negative 1, 1, and 2. And you will see the answers listed as negative 1, 1, and 2. Um, there's, let's see, so many things to cover from algebra and so little time. But I'd like for you also to look at an example of what we call the difference quotient because this will turn out to be a very important quantity pretty much by the time we start the third lesson. So given f of x equals x squared, can you identify what will be the value for f of x plus h minus f of x all over h? And I'll do the first one. First one I'll give you guys um, maybe time to do the second one. For the first one, to find f of x plus h, just take your f of x, and everywhere you see an x, replace it by x plus h. So this is what we get. Minus f of x, that means just write the same given function as it is, everything divided by h. And all you need to do is after this point, simplify this a little bit, which I have done on the next page. I did the FOIL for x plus h quantity square. I got this. Then I cancel the plus a negative x squared with each other. I got this. And then I factored out an h from the top and cancel that with the h from the bottom. So there's our answer there. So again, please try the second example. And when you're ready, come back to check the final answer on that one. And I'll leave it here for you. And I would like to leave you with two questions to think about, and we're going to discuss those in the classroom if you're in my lecture class, or we will discuss them in the discussions board uh, if you're in my online class. So let me find those two questions. Okay, here's one of them. Please write this down, work on it, and be prepared to discuss this question. You know, feel free to put your solution or ask any questions about it in our course discussions board for the online students. So there's one question I'd like for you to think about. And here is another. This is a really good question, checking your understanding about functions. So with that, I'm going to wrap up this lesson, and next we're going to take a look at a very brief review of trigonometry.